they come into our final hours together. Uh, there are a lot of things we could do. Uh, my goal, obviously, is to always have you leave with the strongest amount of your emotion geared in your body, because that's what's going to get you to go follow through. At the same time, I look at this program, and no matter how much we pour into it, no matter how much we put you to overwhelm, as you can only imagine, there's so much things, so many things that I know are available and needed for your businesses that aren't here. So I'm trying to figure out what do we put in here strategically. And so I'd like to roll the dice on something that uh, may not be as emotionally exciting, but probably more valuable. And that is a planning process. And so you might have to, for this last part, really manage your own state a little bit. But I'd like to introduce you to what I call RPM, the Rapid Planning Method. And RPM is an experience that when you master the thinking of RPM, you don't have to use the system itself even. You don't have to use a particular you know, mechanical system in terms of how you do this on your computer or calculator or on paper or whatever. But if you take on this thinking system, your entire planning process will transform and so will you emotionally. And most people in life, when they're trying to plan something, when they're trying to put something together, like plan their day, we all learned yesterday that what controls our focus controls our life. Whatever we focus on, we feel, even if it's not true. Do you agree with me on this? Yes or no? And everything's trying to get our focus all the time, right? Advertising's trying to get our focus. Your phone's ringing in your pocket. It's buzzing. And that buzz is either your phone or it's an email or it's a text. There's this constant something trying to get control of our focus. But what you focus on determines your destiny in your life. So if you don't take control of it, somebody else will. And so the challenge is, even when we try to take control of our own focus, even when we try and attempt to do this, usually there's so much distraction that it becomes very difficult to do it. And even if you did it in a traditional way, and you were going to go out tomorrow, and you're going to plan your day, or you're going to plan your week, you're going to go home. In order to plan it, you're going to have to come up with some answers, answers for the week. And the question you're going to ask if you don't know RPM is what? What do I need to, say it nice and loud, what do I need to, and that's a good question. It's much better than why do I have to do this. It's much better than what the hell do I do. A few modifiers around that language and you'll feel very different, won't you? So when you ask, what should I do, the answer you're going to get is usually based on whatever is most pressing on you at that moment. And what tends to press us is either something painful, right? Right now I've got to do this. If I don't do this, something's going to happen. Or something that we want, something pleasurable. Is that true? Or it could be our own sense of vision. But that's usually the last thing that we focus on. How many agree with me on this? Say I. So let's say, for example, someone keeps coming to you and goes, I need this and I need this and I need this. And they do that in the form of your text. They do that in the form of a phone call. They do that in the form of an email. They do that in the form of walking up to you and go, hey, 2020, can I ask you a question? And right in that moment, they're coming to you and they're asking for the most valuable thing you have in life, your focus. Because out of your focus, you're going to put your attention, your energy, your intellect, your emotion, your thoughts, your lifeblood. And the way you invest focus is the way you invest thought, feeling, emotion, and life. And wherever you spend that focus is going to determine what you end up with in this life and what you're able to give in this life. So focus, bless you, is the single most important component you can learn to take control of. And most of us are not very good at this. Primarily because the culture has conditioned us to respond to what we need to do. And when you're coming up here, Dr. Ruth, here in front of me, and she goes, 20, 20, 20, what do you do right now is it's being dictated by the environment, not necessarily by what is most important for me or my mission or my direction or my life. Now, in a seminar, it's appropriate most of the time because this is what I'm here to do. But even in a seminar, sometimes I have to say, can I get back to you in a moment because I have to do this because I'm also running this damn thing. I'm not just on stage, right? So the combination makes me have to look at it. And there's an army of people back here running it, and I've got to help them, or they've got to help me, and a lot of moving parts. So sometimes I've got to stop and not let you take my focus, even though I'd like to give it to you. But if I were to ask, what do I need to do, I'm going to get a certain quality of answer. I'm going to give you an example of what I mean. 
true story. President, I won't go any deeper than what I can reveal without uh, being disrespectful in any way, shape, or form. I would never do that. Um, but it's a known fact because it got out in the newspapers. There was a stage when President Clinton called me. And when he called me, he literally called me up and said, and I'd known him for a little while and worked with him prior, but he called me up and said, they're going to impeach me in the morning. What should I do? And I kid about it today, and I say, I said to him, uh, well, could you have called me sooner? <laughs> you know? But what truthfully I said after that was, I can give you my answer to that question, but I don't know if that's really the question you want to answer. Because the answer what you should do requires a different question to be asked first, which is what's most important to you. Because if what's most important to you is to stay in office, then obviously you should just keep doing what you're doing because even though they will try to impeach you, they won't have enough votes and you'll stay in office. But if your outcome, what do you want? What's your outcome? What's the result you're after? That changes what you do. If your outcome is to regain respect from mothers, fathers, what they can say to their children about the President of the United States, then based on that, you might have to do something different. And I said, it's easy for me to say, because I'm not in your position, and I'm not facing an inquiry in the legal side. And he said, yeah. And I said, but you're also a lawyer. And you certainly know the law. And I said, you know what you can say. He goes, yeah, well, you don't have somebody coming at you, you know, you know, stars coming after me. He's trying to do this, trying to do that. I said, I know that. So I'm not telling you what to do. You're just asking me what to do. I won't tell you that. First, you've got to tell me, what do you want? If you don't know your outcome, if you don't know the real result you're over and you answer what to do, you may even get what you want. You may do that, get the result, but it's not the result you really wanted. That's, again, the difference between strategy and tactics, isn't it? which is one of the single most important lessons I hope we got across to you this week. So you've got to learn to ask a different question than what to do, because how many of you found out that it doesn't matter how, what the day in your life is? If you really write down everything you've got to do, there's no way in hell you could do it all. How many agree with me on this? Raise your hand and say, I. So most of you start out in the old days with a little time management book, and you used to write down all your to-dos, right? How many used to have one of these? Right? You write down all your to-dos, and then in the early days, you actually put like A, B, C priority maybe in the very beginning. Anybody get that angle to be able to do that? Separate them out so you focus on the priorities, and then maybe even plan when you were going to do them in your day. And that lasted about how long? You still carried that book around with you in those days when it was on paper, remember that? But what it was was your address book in those days because you didn't have an iPhone, right? It was your calendar and your address book and a few crappy things you wrote down. But you never sat down and wrote the whole list out because you knew you weren't going to do it all and it just felt like hell every day to rewrite it all. Who can relate to what I'm saying as being true? Say, ah. So when I only had one company to run, I was just a kid. I went to one of those programs prior to the days of Franklin and Covey and all those guys. It was called the Time Bank. And we had this three-ring binder like this. It was so cool and it had its tabs and had my calendar in the front so I could schedule things and have these daily little tabs I could plan out the day and write my to-do list and then have my A through Z's in the back where I could file under people's names and things, all the details I needed. And then that was all the phone information because there wasn't email in those days. And you carried around this little mini suitcase with these big rings and it worked really cool. It was great. But I learned once I had two companies and then three and then four and then five, there was no way. My, my to-do list got bigger and bigger and never got to be done. And I found myself not writing it down. And then I found myself doing it in my head. And I got a pretty good memory. But, man, that was painful. I felt the shock of it all over again. <laughs> Bottom line is, I said, there's got to be a better way. And I kept thinking, what controls our life is what we focus on. What we focus on, we feel. What we feel and focus on, we move towards. Wherever focus goes, energy flows. So wherever your focus goes, energy flows. So if I want to control my focus, the most powerful way is by asking what? Better questions. So I need to come up with a better question, because what to do is a painful question. And it's a stupid question very often. When you're starving hungry on the first day, what to do is obvious. Go get some food. But some of you, in spite of the hunger, and those of you who never been to a program in my mind, the pissed offness with Tony Robbins that he would go so long, if you went back, they go, but this is not right. 
And so they said, then go get some food. They go, no, but I don't want to miss it. <laughs> now, our fault for not communicating in advance, but the point of the matter is most of you decided what to do based on a larger outcome than the urgency of current pain. You decided, no, what's most important is to get this material, even if it's a little painful in the short term, I can eat a little bit. I'm hungry, but I can survive. I'm not in Africa. This is not the last meal that I've had for six weeks. There may be some body fat I could be burning in the next two hours while I'm learning. Who knows? You know, maybe. Maybe I'm not really dying. Maybe that's just the language I use, and the language I use is producing my emotion. People say they're starving. Really? Look in the mirror. Are you starving? <laughs> no, I didn't say that to anybody because no one came up and said anything to me about it. That Tony, that Tony, oh, Tony, we take a picture with me. Yes, of course. Right? <laughs> <laughs> My point is this, where focus goes, energy flows, you must control your focus, you do it with questions. If you ask the same questions as everyone else, you end up with the same answers. So how did Bill Gates change his economic world? He was a software designer who didn't say, how do I make better software? He asked and caught everyone else to ask, how do we become the intelligence that controls all computers worldwide? How do we become the intelligence that controls all computers worldwide. Now, when that's your outcome, do you end up with a different to-do list than if your outcome is to build the best software, yes or no? Yes. And that's why he's one of the richest men on earth. Change a question, change your life. When it comes to planning your life, I want to get you to learn to ask three questions now. And the first one is not, what am I going to do? And how many understand why now? Say, I. The question you want to ask yourself is, what do I want? What's my outcome? What's my result? The word RPM, the first one is to get you focused on the target. The target is not the activity. The activity can change. It's what the, what's the result I'm after. If you know exactly what it is you really want, what you desire, what you're really after, clarity is power. The more clear you are on specifically what you want, the faster your brain can get you there. But if you're generally saying things like, what do I want? Well. You know, I want more money. Fine, here's a dollar. Get out of here. <laughs> Did you achieve the outcome? Yeah, when you're that general, you may be, you think you're not getting your goal. You are. The way you language your goal, the way you think about it, you're receiving it. You know, you know, I, you know, I want to feel a bit better. I want to lose some weight. Fine, you lost a pound. You're done. Because your brain's like a servo mechanism and a bomb and a missile. The old days, you shoot a missile, and the target was going, and if you missed the trajectory, you missed it. Today, what happens when the missile's not on course? What happens? It locks on the heat signature, what does it do? It moves and follows it. That's the way your brain is if it knows the outcome, if it knows the result. So RPM starts with, i got to know the result. This is a results planning system. The rapid planning method, but you can think of it as a results planning system. I need to know the result and the after before I ever ask myself what to do. That takes more time. But it's worth it. Now, for time's sake, I'm not going to do this with you right now, but I'll tell you what I do when I've taught this to people and I've got a full weekend of being the same. Just give you a picture. If I asked you right now to write out your name, your full name. Now, some of you abbreviate your signature, but write out your full name in cursive. Go and do that one time. Write out your full name in cursive. I can't even use the word cursive. Is that really the word people still use? Move in handwriting, I guess, but in cursive. Just write it out full name, because you can do this later on. Full name. If you normally abbreviate, don't do the after I have full name. Now, if I had you get with a partner, and you can try this later if you want. I'm just going to tell you because I don't want to take the time, because we have such limited time today. And I have your partner say to you with a stopwatch here, okay, ready? And I go, go. And you write it out. And you tell me when you're done. I go, stop. And I write down how long that was. So let's say you wrote out your signature, and it took five seconds. And I say, ready? Write it out. Ready? Go. You tell me you're done. Stop. And I write down five seconds. I have to do that ten times. You'll find in the beginning you'll be, let's say, six seconds. I'm making it up. Every signature is different. And you probably might get down to as little as five seconds. If you have, like, an iPhone, you could do it as a digital stopwatch. You could see the middle seconds. And then I say to you, I want you guys to write every other letter in cursive. In other words, you can write half as many letters. How long do you think it would take to do it? Half as much time? 
Most of you will take twice as much time in the beginning, and then eventually, what's interesting is, if I do it 10 times, and the last two or three, and this makes no logical sense, and again, I don't want to take the time to have all of you do this 10 times, 10 times, 10 times, but you can go do it on your own, I'll just tell you the result. In most cases, even though you're doing half as many letters, you cut it by two-thirds of the time. There's something happens when you break an old pattern and you do it fresh. Your brain over the years has learned ways to move more rapidly since when you did your original signature, and you'll do it a third the amount of time. It'll take twice as much at first, and then it'll cost you a third amount of time. Now, let me tell you why I'm telling you this. The system I'm calling the rapid planning method, by the time I show it to you, you're going to go, this takes more time than just making my to-do list. When? When will it take more time? When? Initially. But once you get it in your nervous system, it'll take you less time because your brain will be thinking in outcomes and not activities. And when you think in terms of outcomes and not activities, pretty soon some of the activities you're going to you need to do to get the outcome. You find a better way to get the outcome quicker. Now, how do you do that? You have three questions. Question one, what is my result? What is my outcome? What is it I really, truly want from this? If you're going back next week, and you say this next week, what are the most important what? Outcomes for me to get this week in my business. And you just write those outcomes out. Not your action items, the outcomes. You, if you do that and nothing else, you'll be ahead of the game. And if you just keep looking at those outcomes every day, how am I doing on that outcome? Your brain will come up with ways to get to that outcome. I promise you. Focus on outcomes, not on activities. Action for most people. Activities, most people may mistake movement for achievement. They mistake action items and to-dos for achievement. We're after the achievement. Are you with me on this? Yes or no? It's a different way of thinking, and I think all of you inherently have it, but if you make this ritualized, just like the things you learned this week, they're all great, but if you don't systematize them, they'll work when you do them. But if you systematize them, right, and you see, like Mr. Holloman here, when he goes in and just does it and does it, makes sure it's been done again, or what you've seen Chet do, or what I do, you just do it over and over again, you don't miss it, now the results are geometric. So I want to get you to systematize the thinking, whether you do it visually the way I'm going to show you or not. So, first question, what's the result I'm after? What's the ultimate result? What do I want out of this week, out of this thing, out of my business, out of my life, out for my body? And you want to be as what as possible when you describe that outcome, that result. As what? As clear and specific as possible. Generalities will confuse you. So it might take you longer than just writing down call so-and-so to think, if I'm calling my, my son, I'm going to call Jarek, or I'm going to call my brother. This is what goes through my head before I call him, always. What's my outcome? Because I don't want to just call him. I want Jarek to feel loved by his dad, or I'm thinking about what's my outcome. I've got to talk to him about this thing that's out there. I've got to make sure I get through to him on this, because... I want to guide him and move him in this direction. That's what I want to be as his father. I want to, I want to just chit-chat. I can do that too. If you think before every phone call, before every time you're planning your day, and you think before you have any meeting, what do you think the first thing I ask of anyone when we sit down in a meeting is? Okay, what are your, what are your outcomes? What, what are the outcomes for this meeting? First thing I want to know, because when I know the outcomes, guess what? A lot of meetings, they're done pretty quick. Because I know the outcome, you don't have to go through all the activities to sell me on it. Just catch your outcome. How do you want to do it? Sounds good to me. Rock. That's how you make a meeting productive. I know a meeting's productive not by the hours or time. Sometimes it takes longer to the outcome than you want, but I'm going to get the outcome. That's, by the way, what you see with me on stage. That's why our times vary. It's based on an outcome. So I'm going to get that outcome. I don't give a damn whether it's the right time or not. I want to do it that time, but I must deliver the outcome. How many get that? And by the way, how many like to have your company focused on outcomes, results, and not activities? Say I. People say all the time. Well, did you get that done? Well, you know, I left them an email. I, I, I left them a voicemail. I sent them three emails. How many times you heard that? When that happens with me, I'm like, ah, you know, but I don't show it. I just like, really? Wow, that's fascinating. Well, let's explain about our culture. It's about getting the result. So. I can help you if you can't figure another way to do it, but there may be 12 other things we might want to do. Maybe they don't have the answer. Maybe somebody else can give us the answer. The outcome was to get this information, not to leave an email or 12 or three voicemails. That will not do any of us any good. 
how many fall. Now, whether you get the outcome or not, whether you get that result, will be based first the clarity. And the second thing is, whether you got enough emotional juice to keep going after it when things don't work out. So the second part of RPM is the purpose. RPM, by the way, how many knows what it means when you increase the RPMs in a car? Anybody here? What does that do? It builds up what? Power, speed. Higher RPMs, you can explode through something, right? You can make something happen. So think of this metaphorically also, this rapid planning method, this result planning method. So it's rapid planning, it's a result planning. You want a results-focused, purpose-driven, massive action culture. That's what RPM stands for. It's how you build up power and you break through. But whether or not you get that result will be, are you clear and specific, but also, do you have enough juice when it doesn't work out? How many of you are going after an outcome in your day or in your week, and for whatever reason, you're not able to get it? The person doesn't respond, they're not there, the thing's not there, uh, something interferes, somebody interrupts you. Who's had their plans interrupted? Raise your hand and say, I. So whether you keep doing it or not is do you have enough emotional juice? See, guys, you all know out of this week, you got more than enough to take your business to all another level. You've got more ways. You can go home and go home and be artists now. And some of it, you know, we buy so fast, but many of you have the program. You'll watch enough times. You'll be there. Some of you are going to invite us in. We're going to be there. Make sure you do it. So it's going to happen. But the art of it being followed through or not is going to come to you have the emotion to follow through, and that needs to be a part of your thinking also. So the next question I've always asked besides the outcome is why. Why is more important than how? Why are we doing this? What's the purpose? Purpose is more powerful than object. Purpose is more powerful than object. You say, I want a million dollars. That's a great objective. I want a billion dollars. Great objective. I want to feed 3,000 children in my community. That's a beautiful objective. It's even more specific. But even that objective, you might get excited about so you realize what it takes to feed 3,000 kids. Right? And the politics involved, and all the people that don't follow through. And then you have this good intention, and then somebody else is pissed off because one of the kids didn't get fed. Right? And you do everything you know how to do. What's going to make you keep going? Purpose. Why do you want to feed those 3,000 kids? Why do you want to make that million dollars, that billion dollars? Why are you going to take your business to the next level? Why is the most important thing to know? Because that's where all the emotional juice and fuel is to actually get you to go through when the challenges show up. Every person you see who's on fire and successful knows the why. You know what the problem is? You might know the why at the beginning. You wrote a mission statement and stuff like that. You don't know why you're doing this right now. This right now. That's what's going to engage you and activate the why. You might have a why, but it's not active. How many followers are I'm talking about here? Say I. Otherwise, that little law of familiarity shows up. You know, well, we're doing this because da, 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 and you repeat the why, but there's no emotion behind it. See, if I take um, a stick pin, no, I don't know if anything like that, but you know, you know when a woman has a blouse that has like a stick pin in it? Let's think of that stick pin as a word. If I take that stick pin and I throw it at you, are you going to feel it? Barely. What if I take that little stick thing called the word and I wire it to the back out of a giant iron bar called the motion? Now I can take that stick thing and, and put that thing right to your heart. That's the power of why. R, P, M. R is the result, the outcome. What you're after, P is the purpose. It's the why. 80% of success is why. 20% is how. To a big enough why, people will figure out how to do it. Yes. How many agree with me on this? Say I. So you better know your why. So, talking to the president, tell me something. What's your outcome? And then why? And once we know the why, we know what you're after and why, then the question is, how do we do it? We know what we're after, why, how do we do it? By the way, are there lots of hows to get to an outcome, yes or no? Are there many paths to get a result, yes or no? Some are more efficient than others. And you're not going to know. So you know what you do? You brainstorm out all the hows you can think of. All the things you could possibly need to do to get that result. And then you narrow it down to the 20% that makes 80% of the difference. And you'll find out you don't have to do that whole to-do list. In fact, wouldn't it be nice to write your whole to-do list and not do it and still get the outcome? How many prefer that? Say, ah. 
That's RPM. I love it when I don't do my to-dos and I got the outcome. That's the coolest thing in the world. You might have done one or two of them, but it's been learning selectively which ones are going to create it. But the only way to do that is to brainstorm out the M, the massive action plan. If I know the result I'm after, I know what it is I want, what's the outcome, what's the result, what do I want specifically, clearly, and I know the why, and the why has got to move who? Who does the why have to matter to? Well, if it's a why you're trying to get everybody to deal with, they got to have a why involved in it. But people do things for different reasons. People donate money for different reasons. Some of you donated money the other day here because you were moved by the experience. Some of you did it for connection. Some of you did it to contribute. Some of you felt guilty if you didn't do it because somebody else did beside you. Or you have a lot of money and you feel guilty about it because you didn't earn it. I'm not saying everybody in this room, but that's how some people are. They inherited it, so they feel guilty. Some people do things to get their name up on the wall. Some people today do it anonymously and then tell everyone. <laughs> Isn't it true? Yeah, yeah just confidentially, that was neat. You know, yeah. And everybody tells, tells everybody that it's anonymous. They're doing it for significance. Some do it for connection. Some do it for contribution. I don't care why a person does it, but we do it. But if you're going to work with a group of people, you better make sure the why touches on all their needs. Does that make sense? When it's you, who's, who's why does it have to be? Who's why does it have to touch? Whose purpose does it have to be? Your own feet to be moved. So if you know the result and you know the purpose, now you need the M, which is the massive action plan. We also call the massive action plan the map. It's your massive action plan, your map. How are you going to get there? What are you going to do? By the way, when you're crystal clear on what you want and you know why you want it, you can make a big map. You can bring some a million ways to do it. Not all your houses are going to work. That's why you make a whole map. And then go back and gradually asterisk the ones that are the most important and go hit those. You might get the whole outcome in the first two action items and get rid of your whole rest of your list. This is RPM. This is how I operate. Now, if you never did this on paper and you just did this thinking process in your head, you'll be invaluable resources. If you learn to put this on paper, it'll be more powerful because then your brain isn't racing and you can see it. If you make it into a system that you personally use, your productivity will explode. If you teach your whole company to do this, your company will go to levels you can't even imagine because everyone will maximize their productivity. And it is different than any other system in its essence because it causes a different focus with a different level of emotion, greater creativity as a result of that, and then it shows you how to leverage it all. Does this make sense? So those three pieces, results planning, asking what question, what's the first question you're going to always ask? What do I really want? What's my... Outcome. What's the actual result I want from this day, from this week, from this conversation, from this meeting? Doesn't matter what it is. If that's all you ever do, you're already practicing RPM at a fundamental level. But if you want to juice it up, you'll ask the second question. What's the second question? Quick. Why do I want it? Why? What's juicy about this? What excites me about this? What do I really want about this? If I want to call this person, why am I calling them? And you know what? When you get a stronger why, the action items change because you're in a different what? Who knows? A different what? Make that same call without any clear outcome and any clear purpose. Or well, the outcome is get back to them. That's my goal. Get back to them. What's going to be the quality of the writing or the phone call or the vocal quality when you're getting back to somebody? Versus if you know my outcome is to make sure they feel like I am so in their corner that I'm here to make sure their needs are completely met more than they've ever met by any person they've ever spoken to on the phone before, and that I'm here for them and they can count on me. Why? Because that's who the hell I am. Because when people deal with me, they have found someone like no other human being they've ever dealt with, and I am the source they can count on. That's why I don't have to go chase 8 million new clients. That's why they stay my client for 17 years and pay me a million bucks a year to talk to them on the phone once every 10 days for 10 minutes and see them three times a year for an hour. And I get a piece of the upside, so sometimes I get a couple million dollars for that. Why would somebody pay you that kind of money? Because when my guy calls me, he gets delivery he can't get anywhere else on the face of the earth. So I pride myself in that. And by the way, that feels juicy to me. It meets my need for contribution, my need for growth, my need for significance. I'm the best at what I do. My need for certainty, I deliver. And sobriety, who the hell knows what's going to happen when I pick up this phone? It's different every time. 
Is the market saying something, saying something's going on? How many follow? Say I. It's a very different thing than how I'm getting back to my client. Right? And the way you're going to come across is different. And everybody will go, wow. And in life anyway, by the way, the people are the very best on earth that get paid everything like 100 times more than everybody else. They're just a little bit better than everybody else. It's like, you know, bears chasing you. I don't have to be that fast, just that much faster than you. Right? In life, you just have to be a little bit better than everybody else, and you get all the rewards. And that little bit better, to me, is RPM. Okay? Now, RPM is also a visual chunking system. Visual way to chunk. Remember the other day when I showed you this little concept of this chunking system? Where, you know, you have this to do, and this to do, this, this, this to do, I got this, 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 this.